Candida is a yeast, not the maple syrup loving country in North America. Although Candida can be found in Canada as well. Candida sometimes causes a mild yeast infection, but in some situations it can get into the bloodstream and cause severe illness. Now, there are various types of Candida species, and over 20 of them can cause disease in humans. There's C. albicans, C. parasilosis, C. tropicalis, C. glabrata, C. crusae, C. oris, and the list goes on. Of these, the most common one is C. albicans. Candida is found throughout the body. It likes warm, moist environments like the mouth, the diaper region of babies, and in women, it can be found in the vagina. Now, it's normal for microbes like bacteria, fungi, and viruses to live all over the body. But each microbe is slightly different in terms of whether it's colonizing the body, in other words, just living and not causing any problems, or whether it's infecting the body, which is causing some degree of tissue damage or destruction. An important factor is exactly how much of a microbe is present. Candida is considered an opportunistic microbe. When the amount of candida is relatively low, it's harmless. But if a person's immune system is weakened, or if there's less competition for the candida, then the amount of candida can increase, and that's called candida overgrowth. Now, candida can exist in multiple forms. It's kind of like a chameleon. Sometimes the cells can appear round or oval, and these are called yeast cells. Other times it can appear like hyphae, where it looks like long, thin filaments, kind of like a segmented cactus plant. It can also take an in-between appearance, called pseudohyphae. Each of these morphologies, or looks, reflect the same candida cells that are expressing different protein profiles. And they give the cells different properties. When the candida is in yeast mode, it's better at moving from one part of the body to another. Whereas when it's in filamentous mode, it's better at invading tissues. Candida typically lives on the skin or mucous membranes, and when it starts to overgrow, it can damage nearby tissue. With this, there are a few patterns of injury. The most common one is pseudomembranous candidiasis, and it's primarily due to a weakened immune system that allows for candida overgrowth. The result is destruction of the stratified squamous epithelium layer, which is the outermost layer of the skin or mucous membranes. This causes accumulation of the destroyed cells in the keratin protein that fills the outermost layer, forming a white lesion called a pseudomembrane that looks kind of like cottage cheese. The white lesions aren't typically painful, and they can be scraped away with a tongue depressor, leaving behind a red mucosal base which sometimes bleeds. Since the underlying cause is a weakened immune system, it's fairly common in young infants and the elderly both groups that have a relatively weak immune system. It can also be related to an immunosuppressive condition, like diabetes or HIV, or from immunosuppressive medical treatments, like steroids, including inhaled steroids, as well as radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Another pattern of injury is called erythematous candidiasis, and that typically results from a change in the levels of microbial competition keeping candida in check. For example, a course of antibiotics or tobacco smoking, which both selectively destroy certain bacterial populations more than they affect candida. The opposite is true as well. Sometimes there are mechanical devices like braces that favor candida growth more than the growth of other microbes. In either situation, the result is an overgrowth of candida, which causes increased blood flow to the affected tissue with red painful lesions. In a lot of situations, there's a mixed pattern of injury with both a pseudomembranous and erythematous component. Candidal infections can affect various parts of the body. The most common location is in the mouth, where it causes thrush, which is usually a pseudomembranous candidiasis. So classically, it looks like white cottage cheese on the buccal and gingival mucosa. Candida can also affect the esophagus, resulting in an esophagitis that can cause pain with swallowing. Candida can affect the diaper region of babies, causing a diaper rash with redness surrounded by scattered red spots that are called satellite lesions, because they look like tiny red satellites that are not contiguous with the rest of the rash. Another common one is vulvovaginitis, 
commonly called a yeast infection in women. And it can cause vaginal itching and discharge as well as pain while urinating. Now, in addition to local infections, candida can cause more serious invasive infections. And these often develop in individuals that have underlying immunodeficiencies. Other risk factors for serious candidal infections include hyperglycemia and reduced stomach acidity. The most common situation is an infection of a prosthetic device like a central venous catheter. In these settings, candida forms a biofilm, which is where the yeast lives inside a jelly-like matrix of proteins and behaves more like a large colony than like a collection of individual cells. Candida is able to infect devices, and if the infection isn't treated, then over time small clumps of yeast-laden biofilm can break away, at which point they can get into the blood and cause infections in other locations, like on the heart valves. From the blood, candida can also cause infections in the liver and spleen, as well as the bones and joints. It also likes to cause infections in the kidney. The candida can reach the kidney from the blood, as well as by going up the ureters after a urinary tract infection. Candida can also cause meningitis, in particular if it infects a device in that space, like a ventricular shunt. What's more is that candida can cause particularly worrisome infections of the eye. Diagnosis of oral candidiasis can be confirmed with a culture, and ultimately a tissue biopsy might be done in some cases as well. For invasive infections, antigen testing can also be done. For example, one test looks for a cell wall component called beta-D-glucan, which is found in candida and a few other fungal species. Another test is candida PCR, which detects candidal DNA. Treatment of candidiasis depends on the location and severity of the infection. Oral thrush is treated with oral nistatin suspension, whereas vulvovaginitis and skin infections are treated with topical antifungals. Resistant infections are often treated with azole antifungal medications. In severe infections, especially when there's a prosthetic device like a catheter or a ventricular shunt that's infected with a biofilm, it's often necessary to remove the device. Severe infections are often treated with a medication like amphotericin, azole antifungals, or echinocandins, like mycofungin. Alright, as a quick recap. Candida is an opportunistic fungus that can overgrow in situations where there are fewer competitive microorganisms or a weakened immune system. Common sites of infection include the mouth, the esophagus, the vulvovaginal region, and the groin in infants. These superficial infections are usually treated with nistatin, or topical antifungals. Severe infections include those where a biofilm forms over a prosthetic device, and typically require removal of the infected device.